Welcome to our last session, um, post-pandemic parenting, um, and how children and adolescents are returning to life in 3D. Um, I'm very honored to be on the same panel as Dr. Amit Sen, who's a child and adolescent psychiatrist. He's also the co-founder of Children First and enjoys building mental health management systems for schoolgoers and young adults. Meghna Mukherjee um, is a psychoanalytical psychotherapist who enjoys working with adolescents and adults. She's in the process of building Engaging Circle, a space for mental health professionals to make psychoanalysis a mainstream intervention. Welcome to you both. And I'm Sunalini. Uh, I'm a communication specialist, uh, well, professional. <laughs> um, so very quickly, if both of you can just do one round of telling us what parents and children went through during the pandemic. Okay, so you want to spend the rest of the panel discussing <laughs> it? <laughs> <laughs> <I won't. laughs> That's why I said very quickly. very quickly. If you can do it in a line you want to go for? or two. Uh, yeah, so um, can you hear me? Yeah. So besides, um, of course, the, the huge losses and, uh, and, and terrible trauma that we all suffered through all this, uh, there's been massive anxiety and fear. Yeah? And that has affected, I think, children, parents, all of us. Uh, but over on top of that, there are some things that happened which probably didn't get defined just as well. For instance, uh, you know, the breakdown of the daily routines and structures, which are so central to children's well-being. You know, they, they often uh, thrive in that, you know. Uh, like one of my um, older colleagues way back many years ago said that there's no badly behaved child, there's only a bad routine. So uh, <laughs> all the routine and everything went for a six, and the scaffolding, that school or daily rhythms, or even the rhythms of weeks and months and holidays and, you know, birthdays, etc. all those things went away. So children didn't have anything to look forward to. There was nothing to hold them together, you know? And parents found it very, very challenging to be able to implement that without the other systems in place, right? So that was one thing. The second thing was the institutional breakdown, of course, you know, schools, colleges being shut down, no transport, no hospital services. Um, and that also, again, you know, brought about massive confusion. Also because it just went on, you know, after the first um, phase started, uh, we felt, oh, it's uh, a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, and we be back on track, isn't it? Yeah, but it went on for four months, five months, six months, and then it would never stop. And the second wave came, and the third wave came, and before we knew it, it was two full years, right? So it's never ending, it seemed to us, right? And and so there's these institutions, which again give us so much of structure around us, and also it gives us facilities that we live our lives through. You know, that went away, causing massive confusion, frustration, hopelessness, helplessness. And the third thing that went away is our spaces which give us pleasure, which give us joy, which give us meaning. And that could be any of these things, like a child going for football coaching, or teenagers meeting up in a mall and hanging out together, or celebrating your grandmother's birthday, or going for your annual uh, holiday. You look forward to these things, and these, uh, you know, define, and in fact, a large part of these experiences actually help young people to become who they become because they make choices. You see, they want to do these things, they want to belong to a certain social, social cultural group, and those things just collapse completely for the you know for for a good two years, and and that again was had a huge impact on their sense of self. There was a massive sense of loss and grief that people went through as a result, and this includes children and and parents. And parents, of course, were trying their best to simulate a kind of a system and a structure and give children hope, tell them about how school will reopen or how they can go back to their guitar lessons mm -hmm. and meet their friends. But it was not happening, you know, weeks, months, years, yeah? And, and uh, that had, has had a huge impact. And uh, again, I, I believe that, that the effect of this is not going to go away very quickly. And I, although we are wanting to actually put this behind us and think that the COVID is over, that, you know, the pandemic is over and now life is back to normal, um, we have to wait and see how that unfolds. Speaking of uh, relating to people shifted, so like there's no more like a 3D interaction. It's all a 2D interaction. So like people who would sort of, there's so many people I met who came for therapy in the pandemic. And when they first met me after pandemic, they had comments like you have legs. 
you know, or like uh, it just it was so overwhelming for them that just a simple interaction of coming to your safe therapist office, sitting on the couch and seeing your therapist and also experiencing yourself as a real person, those experiences which were not overwhelming for everyone, even that very basic experience became so overwhelming. So I think our entire mode of connecting with each other became online. And the impact of it being that even till date, even if we have physical spaces, people are still preferring, you know, because the online mode, which was so unfamiliar, has become so familiar now. Like it took us two years to adjust to the online mode, that way of relating to people. And now even though we're supposed to come back to the normal way of relating to people, but that's unfamiliar to us now. So I believe that our entire mode of relating has sort of shifted significantly. And I think we yet, we have we yet to understand and see how it unfolds for us, you know. So like, that is one of the observations that I'm observing all the time. That's what I would like to add on. So um, right now, where we are, um, there are several challenges that children are facing, right? Um, a friend of mine who works in a school in Gurgaon was saying how young children, even not even nursery, children in prep, don't know how to climb stairs and are scared of little things around the playground. Things that, because they've never been to a playground, you see, uh, for two years. Um, now, how do parents tackle all of these challenges? Because these are social challenges, there are educational challenges, um, there are all kinds of challenges. What do parents do other than, and as a parent, I know that we often do this, just get on with life, you know? I mean, it's just stairs, go and climb them, you know? Uh, <laughs> that could be for little children. But with older children, we're probably doing the same thing. How do parents address this? So yeah, to uh, start with, I think acknowledge that there has been uh, a lack of opportunity to grow and develop in the way that children are used to doing, right? So, and that includes, um, you know, motor, gross motor, fine motor skills, interpersonal social skills, um, being aware of themselves, emotional awareness and regulation, academic skills, yeah? Skills of even maybe going for a night out to stay with your friend, <laughs> yeah? Of managing yourself over there. So many things have uh, slipped by the wayside. And uh, I think the, just as you said, that, you know, the younger kids who have not gone to school, um, till the time they're, let's say, five or six years old, whereas they would have probably started at three or four, have not learned some of the basic things that they should have done by now, right? And, and similar to that, uh, there are 12-year-olds who, by the time they went back to school, were teenagers. Mm -hmm. And they were in a different phase of life, actually. And to negotiate through that and suddenly get confronted by those realities is hugely challenging, right? And, or, and, and even more so, for instance, you know, young people who uh, could not even take any board exams and suddenly found themselves in college without having taken any exams. Mm -hmm. The rites of passage, you know, of going for those, um, um, uh, the passing out ceremony and, uh, and the parties that they go through together or the holidays that young people go, uh, you know, go for and looks, look forward to for years, you know, that this is going to be that defining moment mm -hmm. when they go out with friends and have fun. All that is gone, right? And they now have to negotiate with the world, which is already very new, and their developmental phase has changed as well, right? So that acknowledgement from parents is the first thing, that this is not going to happen overnight. And these you know, gaps, to fill these gaps will take time. And also to understand that if we push children too hard you know, to, to fill the, these gaps, and, and for instance, you know, educationally, schools have become very nervous that kids who have come to, let's say, grade six, middle school, right, they've missed out on some of the basic um, learnings and reading, writing, maths, and all of that, right? How are they going to cope with middle school or senior school for that matter, right? So let's, you know, bring it on and let's have double classes and let's shorten their vacations, mm -hmm. right? Little acknowledging the emotional uh, upheaval that they've gone through, the sense of loss they might have had, you know, the, the dissonance and the mistrust they have developed in people and mm -hmm. in, in systems around them. And if we do not address that, learning is not going to happen. Can you imagine somebody who's so upset uh, beginning to learn in all these, some of these domains are much more complex than academics, you know? And if we do not address that, then uh, learning is not going to happen. In fact, what it's going to bring on is probably more anxiety and a feeling of inadequacy, 
that, you know, my parents and my teachers and my school is expecting this out of me and I can't do it. That's what's happening. Suddenly this time in March, April said, you have to now come and sit for offline exams. And there was a furor, you know. Kids came with anxiety, panic attacks. They didn't know how, didn't know how to handle it because they're out of practice. You know, their muscle memory, this muscle memory is gone, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, there are these things that I think um, parents have to uh, remember. And of course, there are many other things that one can do. I think in the course of the discussion, we'll, uh, you know, um, uh, hopefully have the time, the space to discuss it. There are many things that parents can do, perhaps, yeah? OK. Talking about exams, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mingta, you had mentioned that cheating was rampant right, uh, <laughs> during the, uh, because suddenly the children were in a space where they were in control because it was a screen. And now they're going back to schools and perhaps colleges where it's back to the teacher being in control. Um, what is happening? What are you seeing now? How did this even come into your office? So, um, oh my God. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, uh, like I was just sharing that, you know, sort of shifting from in-person classes, which was like what they were used to forever, and suddenly it became offline. It was a very disorienting experience for some, and for some it was actually very welcoming. Like, for example, uh, for the want of a better word, kids who have social anxiety, they found this whole experience of having an offline class and, like, the, uh, the autonomy to, like, turn their cameras off or to take their classes from their beds you know, was really, really, uh, it kind of actually helped them because without having to sort of go and face school and deal with the anxieties of how to manage themselves around people, they actually were able to, uh, if not study, do something that was meaningful for them. And uh, I think for the first time, uh, there was a different kind of community, like, you know, so there was like this entire online community. There was an exam happening. There's a WhatsApp group ready. And like all the kids are like discussing the answers and everybody gets you know, good marks. And it actually sort of really helped a lot of students for the first time have a sense of achievement that we can also get those marks. And uh, after about one, one and a half years, even though there's a lot of, there was a lot of uncertainty, especially for kids in class 10th and 12th, where the board exams will happen, not happen, will it be online and offline, you know, they kind of got into a certain rhythm where like uh, waking up for like a eight o'clock class at 7.55 and just sitting and with the camera off and the audio of the teacher is saying attendance low, attendance low. But the child doesn't have to say anything. Ma'am, it was internet. Everyone's internet. Hai. But internet was not. So that was like, kind of like, I think that that was a very, um, I mean, out of all the morbid topics we can talk about, there was a fresh breath of air, right? There was a sense of autonomy. There was at least like, exams will fail. Nahi honge. And that was something that was very welcoming. But imagine like all of them, and going back to school was again very mixed, you know. Again, people who have some kind of a social anxiety issue, that was overwhelming for them. But kids who even wanted to go back to school, uh, not that they didn't want to go back to school, it was amazing for them to meet friends. But all of them come and talk about how it's overwhelming, like how they would prefer smaller groups now, as opposed to having like a group of 10, 11 people. So like there is that social exhaustion, like people get exhausted very fast of social interactions and the whole idea of giving an exam, memorizing it, like having to actually ratta marna padega because ab cheating uski se nahi ho sakti hai. You know, that sort of, again, like things that were so, that was so, so called normal and accepted, you know, and then people sort of learn to like have a different kind of a life. Now they have to go back and actually memorize and give an exam and remember it's, it was what they were used to for so many years, but it was so easy to not get used to it. It became so easily and familiar. And to familiarize yourself with that again, and then to face, like suddenly they have lost autonomy. Now they're an authority figure, you know, on top of them. So it was, it's, it's a bit disorienting for the kids. Uh, some are able to adjust, some are not able to adjust. And um, I think we have to give them a lot of time. We just can't assume that schools khul gaye, so everything is not going to go back to normalcy because it's not going to happen because schools keep shutting on and off. Somebody else gets COVID, the class gets shut. So that uncertainty is still not really gone. Uh, so we have to give these kids a lot of time and not pressurize them. Can I just uh, add maybe a, a couple of things? 
Firstly, uh, Meghna, what we call cheating here, in uh, international universities are called open, open book exams. Book exams. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. So, so what I, I really, um, um, you know, um, could resonate with what you said, that there are some children who re found this new found reality uh, comforting because of, you know, yeah. their own wiring or the way their temperaments are and so on. Yeah. And there was also a sense of agency they had. Yeah. Like you said, you know, yeah. I know uh, I have the freedom to switch off my camera or uh, not want to speak in a classroom if I don't have to and so on, right? So there was agency, there was choice. Um, uh, not that they all always made the right choices, at least not from an adult <laughs> point of view. But uh, right now what we are saying is, okay, so your choices are gone. Now the adults will take over again yeah. and dictate what you what is good for you in life. And that is problematic. I think that's what we have to watch out for. Yeah. How to help young people collaborate in this process of, you know, sort of recreating an, a, a new reality. You know, so so this this uh, that that I, you know came through to me that yeah, uh, yeah. when he was speaking that we have to have to include young people in the in this process of uh, finding uh, uh, a new normal. Yeah. 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 We can't just take over the agency now. Yeah. But a collaborative approach is something that we will have to creatively sit down and think about, which means we need some policies. We need to sit down and actually have policies around how to have this mm. new normal education uh, set up. Right. Um, but as a parent, uh, I would ask you, how do I even know that my child is anxious? Because, and this is especially in adolescence, where they're just cool, you know, so, I mean, <laughs> they're never going to come and tell me as a parent, unless I've, I'm used to having those conversations with my child have been used to having the conversations from the time the child is whatever, one year old or whatever. Um, but even if you have, uh, teens may not really come and tell you that, you know, I'm not feeling quite okay. How do, how do, how do parents recognize that? How do you, how do you, where, where does your, yeah, your red light, where does rest that, your antennae go? So, uh, of course, uh, awareness of how uh, anxiety could manifest is one thing that parents could become aware of. They could, you know, uh, uh, take the uh, take care to actually read up or watch so much of the stuff that is available on the net nowadays. Um, that's one part of it. But the more more importantly is what you just said, Sunanini, is about how do you create that emotionally safe space where children are willing to come and talk about these things, right? And for that, you have to consciously make that space, the effort to be able to have discussions like this and also be transparent about some of what you have been through as a parent as well. Because see, children can see it. Even if you don't talk about it, you're trying to be very stoic and in control. The fact is that all of us have gone through huge anxieties and we have had, has had to face such uncertainties in our lives, in our careers, about who's going to go and uh, n never return from the hospital. We've all been through it, isn't it? And the kids have watched us, yeah? And, and watched us and taken in all of that anxiety, that uncertainty, yeah, the paranoia that we have lived, isn't it? And so it may be the best time now to talk about it because it's up in the air. It's all everywhere. So in, in a society where we are not very, you know, emotionally savvy or aware, this may be a good time to talk about it because even the so-called good normal kids have gone through anxiety. Even the good parents have gone through a lot of anxiety and depression and, and a lot of upheaval. So it may be a good idea to bring it into uh, the space. And we have to make a proactive, uh, you know, uh, effort to be able to weave it into different systems in homes and schools. I, I can share with you one um, a project or a series of uh, workshops and two projects that we ran with the Delhi government schools during this time, right? So some of you might know that Delhi government school uh, schools two years before the pandemic hit, uh, had started this happiness curriculum. Yeah? And that meant that you know, they were looking at emotional well-being, they were including parents and making a community, they were training their teachers in holistic development and so on, which actually was working very well and they have results to show for that. And then COVID hit us, right? Mm -hmm. And through the first wave, because of the training of the teachers, etc., they were able to hold the boat together, meaning they could you know, continue to remain in contact with uh, you know, uh, parents and parents who did not did not have mobile phones, etc., for these online classes. They could contact other parents and say, "Can you do a, a little group in your home? You know, 
if they have a TV or a laptop, and call some of the other kids in class who do not have these facilities. And they did things like that, which for government schools is absolutely fabulous. But when the second wave hit us, they lost a lot of their own colleagues. And there was mayhem, absolutely. And they couldn't hold it together anymore. And there was so much of grief and pain and trauma. And that's when they asked us, uh, us meaning our organization Children First, to step in and work with the teachers first. So uh, this we did through the Ministry of Education, and we um, included 200 mentor teachers and took them through intensive workshops on grief, loss, trauma, how to rebuild the community, what kind of messages to give, what can they do to bring it together. And of course, there was an outpouring of, of pain and grief and all of that, right? But what they did as a result was when schools actually started, you know, they said, uh, and I hope we had contributed in some way or the other, uh, they, uh, they said to the, uh, the students that you don't have to come with books or, or study. For the first two weeks, you just come in and do what you want. You interact, you connect with your friends, call your parents in, we'll chat. Again, government school, as opposed to some of the private schools, yeah. which went exactly the opposite way. They said, yeah. bring your books and we have to catch up. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, this is what they did. And of course, the second half was that we, they immediately realized the importance of mental health and counselors in schools. So they asked us to, again, help them recruit people, train them, and form a system and, and start a pilot project with 20 schools, which we, we, which we have just completed. So again, here is a an example of how some systems and some spaces have learned from this and are moving ahead and doing things which are new and fresh. And I think that this is an opportunity to do this, you know, yeah? Mm. Mm. So, uh, Meghna, we found even during the pandemic, um, a lot of therapists were telling us that, you know, people used to come to us and not really ask us anything about us. But then you had people asking therapists, how are you feeling today? Are you well? Mm. Um, has this whole pandemic mm. changed your approach to therapy? Has it changed something in your, in your offices? Uh, I think, personally speaking, I don't think that I've seen grief of this magnitude, uh, like especially in the second wave. And I, I think it will forever be etched in my memory, the month of April uh, and May. Uh, these two months will be forever etched in my memory because I don't think I've seen grief of this magnitude. I don't think that uh, even though, like, personally, my training is to deal with terminally ill patients, but that's a very different space. But I think I had two months, sessions after sessions, nine to ten sessions in a day, where all I'm hearing is uh, my mom's in the hospital, my parents are in the hospital, my grandmother passed away. And there was a time for a month, every session was a grief session. And I, I don't think that, and it's not that the grief was only in their house. It was in my house as well. It was in all of our colleagues' house as well. And I think it, uh, in a way, it kind of blurred the boundaries, like who was the patient and who was the therapist. Uh, there was a very humble uh, breaking of the boundaries. And I think it, it taught us so much. It taught us about, um, you know, grief can sort of do so much to a person it can sort of open us in ways that I think no other uh, experience can. So I think it did change to a large extent uh, the whole approach and idea of therapy. Like, uh, I think for a while, I was okay personally if some boundaries got broken. If, you know, if somebody was going through a lot of grief, they needed to know that their therapist could understand that, or their therapist also was having a kind of a grief. And that kind of sharing, which usually doesn't happen, in the sense that we're very strict with boundaries. We're very strict with not opening up about our own personal stories. But I think that kind of a fuzzy blurring of boundaries in that moment really allowed uh, true containment and holding to be possible. So I think it, those two months were months that, um, you know, like, I think it forever changed me. Like, I think in this year when April May happened again, I was uh, remembering so many of my patients I lost, so many patients like adolescents whose parents I lost, whose memories are there in my, whose messages are there in my phone even till date. You know, messages that are so, like, take care of our kids or I don't think I'm going to make it. So I don't know personally what to do with those messages. I had to go through my own therapy for a long time just to be able to process those memories, those experiences. So I think uh, I don't have much to say except that, yes, you know, it did change the way uh, people related. But I think it also opened, it opened us up, like, you know, like, I feel like genuine connection is possible. Uh, it's, op like, people also became a lot more 
free about opening up and i think a lot more people approached us i think the one thing that's that the pandemic can be um, the positive is that people could openly talk about mental health now that there's something called a pandemic a lot of people came a lot of people came and because it became online there were no boundaries so you know somebody from hyderabad can contact someone in delhi somebody in bangalore can contact someone in hyderabad because no longer do you need to physically go so i think that's one of the i would say post traumatic growth in the sense that if you're talking about just post traumatic stress there's also post traumatic growth and i think this is one of the most beautiful openings that everybody can could actually talk about it for the first time i felt mental health became on the forefront so that's that's one thing i think that we should hold on to you know I don't know. I think it's Nietzsche who said that if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. Stronger. <laughs> so I, yeah, yeah. I kind of partly have started believing in it now. <laughs> Any questions? Normalizing the conversation and awareness about mental health have done six years, which obviously means that this is catching up. You know, even though Amrita said that. They don't have a business plan, and yet they've clocked six years so that's through mental health recovery, right? I mean, today you can go to a GP, um, spend two, three hundred, maybe four hundred for one consultation. If you have a fever, he'll give you medicine. If you have a viral, he'll give you something, and you probably have to go to them maybe once again, or if you have. But when it comes to mental health, I don't know. I'm not an expert, but I don't think one session would ever suffice, right? It's just the beginning. They say that costs much more than two, three hundred. Wherever you go, so I guess my poor mistake. I didn't realize it would uh, go so quickly, and yet be so powerful and motivational. Well, thank you all who are here. Thank, thank you to everyone who came. Thanks so much for speaking. Really, really inspired work. Thank you. <laughs>